Hello everyone, bringing you a video today looking at this and the associated trousers. This of course being the British issue Arctic Windproof Smock, the combat smock and combat trousers which were intended for use in Arctic conditions as an outer windproof layer. These were introduced in the mid-1970s along with the other Arctic Warfare kit which turned up on the scene at that point, some of which we've already discussed recently on the channel. And the, as I say, the DPM smock and DPM trousers are a windproof outer layer made of gabardine in contrast to the standard combat clothing at the time which was made of a sateen material. Gabardine of course is a lot closer weave and therefore provides a more windproof outer layer. The reason for picking this particular time to talk about the smock and trousers is they were a piece of kit very synonymous with the Falklands War. Uh, obviously they were on issue to Royal Marines already and they were issued out to the parachute troops attached to 3 Commando Brigade and uh, they were a very popular garment both prior to and after that as well but I thought it was appropriate to cover this topic now given it's the ongoing anniversary of the Falklands conflict. So without further ado we'll get into the main part of the video and talk about the various details that we have uh, in this garment here, the various features of the design. So starting at the top we have similar to the, the Parker we looked at previously, we have a wired cowl on the hood as you can see there had to replace the wire in this it had broken into several sections when i first got this so it has had a new wire fitted and it's just a, a piece of copper wire thick core copper wire and that allows you to shape the hood and give some wind protection to the face that's the idea behind this part of the design you can actually see here an interesting feature of this or something to note is there's a slight difference in the uh, actual dpm print between the main body of the hood and the rest of the smock and the material which has been used to make the cowl and you can see there which just goes to show that some of these changes we see in, in D, DPM cloth some of the differences we see in DPM cloth is purely a change in manufacturing processes a change in the batch this has actually been made presumably with two different batches of DPM cloth so just a, a small detail that I thought I'd bring up here while we're looking at the hood we'll see more details of this as we move the garment round, move, move the mannequin round that is, to have a look at it and look at the various features. One other thing I will mention at the front, looped out of the way at the moment, is the draw cord, which I'll just bring to the front here, because you can see where that runs in a channel, it enters a channel with these two stitched holes on each side here. This is a simple uh, cotton draw cord with a fixed lock uh, closure there, which was quite a common feature on British clothing at this time. This was the, the method that was used for securing draw cords. This little white uh, tab in there just pushes up and locks in position and stops the, the idea of that of course is it stops the draw cord from from slackening once it's been pulled tight so we have that there commonly looped out of the way when the hood is worn down and hung down the back there the front closure of this is a, a weather flap uh, secured by touch and close or velcro fastenings down the front over a heavy duty plastic zip. You can see that there uh, we have the, the actual zip itself is metal but the teeth of the, of the zip are plastic and you can see that runs right down to here, not quite down to the bottom hem but most of the way down the jacket. You have a pull tabs at the bottom here which are actually made of nylon to allow you to assist in securing this and, and fastening the zip and obviously you do have a zip at top and bottom meaning it can be zipped up or zipped down. So that's the front closure there. A feature here which is something that will be carried forward to standard British combat clothing going forward in the 1990s is the rank tab on the front here which will obviously allow you to wear a rank slide uh, on there as opposed to having epaulettes up on the shoulder we have a rank tab at front and one at the back which we'll see as we move this round. In terms of pockets these are all bellows pockets you can see that you can see here that they're all bellows pockets to give a good carrying capacity to the pockets. Two chest pockets, two hip pockets there we open this up you can see this has the section here which folds over to make the pocket a little bit more weather tight so the actual top of the pocket the outer part of the pocket here folds over when the flap comes down to help secure items carried in the pocket and make it a little bit more weather tight you have here large buttons on the pockets as you can see all of these have large four hole buttons and these make it easier to manipulate and open the pockets when wearing gloves which obviously given this is arctic warfare clothing or in, uh, clothing intended for Arctic warfare, it, uh, it makes it a little bit easier when wearing gloves. It's an important part of the design. At some point, these buttons have had tape applied to them. It has been removed in this instance, but that was to uh, a method that was commonly used to prevent wear to the threads and make it less likely the buttons would pop off. So uh, we, we have that there. Also dulls them down a little bit from a camouflage point of view because they are, they are quite shiny. So 
to advantages of doing that there. We do have a draw cord at the waist. You can see the channel for that here. We'll see that when we turn this inside out. And we do also have one at the bottom hem here, as you can see as well there, just the ends of the draw cord on each side there. So that's the front of the smock. We'll start turning this around now and have a look at the various other features of the design. Looking at the right hand side of the mannequin here, you can see this has had insignia glued onto it at some point, unfortunately. It's had parachute wings here and then presumably a, a, a DZ flash beneath that. And then we have, just looking at the, the sleeve here, you do have elbow reinforcement there. And then you have touch and close or Velcro fastener at the cuff. Just a little tab of hooked Velcro there and the soft stuff on this side, just allowing that to be drawn in and tightened in. So a very simple way of doing that really. We lift the hood up here. You can see the draw cord looped around the back there, but just gives you a better idea, view of the hood there. The final piece of touch and close at the front there, allowing this to be fastened right up under the chin, as you can see. Looking at the back of the smock here, if I lift the hood up and out of the way, you can see the draw cord looping around there. We do also have this small draw cord on the back here, which allows the back of the hood to be drawn in. So that pulls up to this attachment point here and actually draws the back of the neck in there, that draws the hood in around the back of the neck, as you can see there. Just pull that out again. You have a re reinforcement piece, and then you can just see the base here of where the rear rank tab would have been stitched on. These were quite frequently removed because they could snag on and interfere with equipment worn on the back. So you would have had a button here and the rank tab up the back there. Looking at the waist here, you can, again, you can see the draw cord, and then down the bottom hem, we've got the channel running around for the, the lower draw cord there. That's the back of the smock. And looking at the left-hand side of the smock here, it's not quite a mirror image. We do have this pocket on the arm here. You can see again, fastened with a large button. And this basically mirrors what you'd find on other combat clothing at this time. So I've turned this inside out now, and we're looking at the front of the interior of the smock. You can see we have a double layer of cloth over the shoulders, which is stitched into the arm seam and into the shoulder seam here, but otherwise is, is loose at the front. We have an internal pocket here, just inside a sort of breast pocket and then we have the details of the the internal draw cord which actually fastens at the side we'll see that in just a moment the details of the zip and closure at the front there as you can see so you do have a, a weather flap behind that as well as you can see just a, an internal flap behind that and then you can see details of the, the pockets and the way they've been worked in at the bottom there as well moving this round to look at the right hand side here I'll just lift the hood up and you can see here this is a double layer of cloth along with the section over the shoulders as you can see there the internal details of the stitching for the arm pocket there, as you can see. And other than that, there's not a huge amount more to see here. I'll just lift the arm out of the way and you can see the adjustment point for the draw cord at the waist. So this can be adjusted in at the side here, tied off, and then there's no need to keep retying it when you put the uh, combat smock on. It's set basically for how tight you want it to be and you can just leave it tied off like that. Looking at the back here, there's not a huge amount more to see. You can see the double layer of cloth runs right across the shoulders there. We lift the hood out of the way, you can see the label here, and we'll get a close-up of this in just a minute. We also have a hanging tag in the collar there, just a piece of the same cord used to make the draw cord, actually has been sewn in to the uh, seam where the hood attaches there. And then we have the ubiquitous poacher's pocket down at the bottom here. Now this could potentially be used to carry some soft kit, but also the smock can be rolled down into itself using this pocket. It can be rolled and buttoned into this pocket at the back here um, for storage or carriage. Looking at the label in more detail here, this is a slightly later example of the smock. You can see it's labeled Smock Combat Windproof Arctic. And then you have the NATO stock number underneath there and then the metric sizing of 18096 and then the NATO sizing underneath that. And then you have the contract number beneath that, the manufacturer and the contract number and the place to put the name and number beneath that. That's the back of the interior of the smock. I'm not going to bother looking at the left-hand side because other than the lack of the, the stitching detail for the arm pocket, there's not really a, a lot more to see there. So we'll move on now to have a look at the trousers from this suit. These are a fairly worn pair of relatively early trousers and we'll see that when we uh, look at the labelling inside. A uh, little bit careworn, these are as they came to me, so I, I need to replace a button here and they have been patched as you can see there. This actually gives a contrast between the two types of cloth that we've mentioned previously both the, the sateen and the gabardine. And we'll get a close up of that now just to show the difference in the two cloths. Obviously this has been repaired with a patch of sateen, as you can see there. Looking at the various features of the design here, we can see the large belt loops around the top here, secured with buttons, as I say button missing off this one here. We have a dressing pocket on the right hand leg here. This would originally have had the same green buttons 
as we have on the rest of the trousers, been replaced with a battle dress type button there. As you can see at some point in the, the life of these trousers, uh, they are quite heavily worn. So presumably had a, a long service life with whoever had these. There are hip pockets on these trousers as well. And you can see here, these actually close with touch and close fasteners, as you can see there. So again, easy to manipulate with gloves and you just have a, a hip pocket in there. So easy to get at when, when wearing gloves. We have two leg pockets there. Again, bellows pockets to give a good bit of carrying capacity. And again, the flaps on these have that doubled over section at the front to make them a little bit more secure. Zip fly there, as you can see, this is a, a relatively lightweight plastic zip in there, as you can see. There's no reinforcement, no knee reinforcement on these trousers. You can see here on the right leg, we have a big patch, again, repairing the knee there where it's, it's torn through in the past. Uh, so definitely a long and hard service life for this pair of trousers. And uh, obviously they were popular because they've been kept in, in use by being repaired. And they're quite neat repairs, really, the way these have been patched, quite a neat job. An interesting feature of these trousers, if we look here, you can see that there is a, a touch and close opening up the side of the leg there. You can see that. And the idea, of course, is these being an outer garment to be worn over other insulating layers of clothing. If you open this up, you can actually pull them on over boots as an, an outer layer. So, uh, say, an interesting feature of the design, something we saw also on the reversible combat clothing, that is to say that the waterproofs, the white, green reversible waterproofs they also have this feature on the leg we'll turn this around and have a look at the back you can see more patching here we have a, another patch worked in there you can see the the rear hip pocket here on this side missing a button again need to replace that at some point as i say these are basically as they came to me you again have a central belt loop here as you can see and otherwise fairly plain we do have some reinforcement around the seat there uh, but otherwise pretty plain at the back you can just see the, the back of the, the two pockets on the sides of the legs there. We'll turn these inside out now and have a look at the interior details. So looking at the inside of these, we have the inside of the front here. We can see we have brace buttons around the waistband there, green versions of battle dress buttons, basically green plastic versions of battle dress buttons. You can see the inside of the fly there with the internal flap behind the zip there. With the bags for the pockets, which are also made of DPM cloth. You can see that there. And then we have just reinforcement across here where the uh, dressing pocket fits onto the leg here and where the stitching is for the button there as you can see. And down the legs here you can see we have uh, the damage here that's been repaired underneath that patch on the leg where the uh, the knee had worn through and then we have the interior here of that uh, velcro or touch and close fastening at the base of the leg there allowing these to be pulled on over boots. You can see that on both sides here. We turn these round here you can see the back and again we have the patch worked in there where there's been a repair you can see details of the the rear pocket there and then we have the label up in just below the waistband here and we'll get a detailed shot of this now this label is a little faded but you can see this reads trousers combat windproof arctic and then below that you have the nato stock number and then the old style sizing size six in this instance and the contract number beneath that and then further details there. And then you have the uh, instruction label launder and reproof in accordance with specification. And then you have the specification for laundering and reproofing these below there. So there we are. I hope you found it interesting looking at this. A very popular piece of clothing, as I say, introduced in the 1970s alongside a lot of the other Arctic warfare clothing and equipment which arrived on the scene at that point. And then certainly very popular, worn right the way through the 90s. Uh, very popular with anyone who could get hold of them uh, away from their sort of intended role as Arctic warfare clothing. I do hope you found it interesting looking at this. If you have and you'd like to see more from the channel, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the notification button down below. That will, of course, alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And as ever, a huge thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. It's greatly appreciated, as I always say. Thank you all very much indeed. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below in the description. And if you'd like to get in touch but you don't really use social media, there is, of course, an email address down there as well. That's everything for this video. So until next time, bye for now.